Good evening and welcome to Conversations with the Candidates. I'm Gene Preuss with the League of Women Voters of Houston. And we're here at Houston Media Source TV to talk to three candidates who are running for Houston City Council District G. Uh, with us tonight, let me introduce you to the three. We have uh, on my left, Duke Millard. Welcome. Thank you. We have Piper Madland. <clears throat> and we have Roy Reyes. And thank you all for being with us. You're the first candidates we've had for a conversation with the candidates in a while for the League of Women Voters. Um, here, uh, because of COVID and other things, Houston Media Source TV, uh, we've been kind of restricted. And so first time in studio in a long time, and it's glad to be back. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. <clears throat> We're going to have some time. I'm going to ask you several questions. Uh, for the viewers out there, District G has been represented by Greg Travis. He won the election, but now he is resigning to run for State District uh, Representative 133 in the House, right, Texas House. So on January 25th of 2022, and I hope I say that date right because that's a, yep. it's a <clears throat> hard going into a new year. 2022, January 25th, that's a Monday? Tuesday. 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 Um, is going to be the special election. You'll have your chance to cast your vote for uh, one of the five candidates. The three are with us tonight, and we'll be talking with them. So let me go ahead and start by a little bit of an introduction. Would you tell us who you are, and we'll start over here, Duke, with you. Okay. Tell us who you are and why you're running for District G. Okay. Uh, my name is Duke Millard. Um, who I am? Uh, that's sort of a philosophical question, so I'll give, just give you some facts. I, I, I grew up in Miami, Florida, <clears throat> graduated from Harvard University in 1980, University of Texas Law School in 1985. I'm an attorney, former federal prosecutor, former counsel to Governor Bill Clements, <clears throat> and a former small business owner. I've lived in Texas since 1981 and in Houston for over 30 years. My children, my siblings, most of my nieces and nephews and good friends live in Houston. I care about this city, and I think it's critical that we keep a conservative, like myself, on city council for District G. I decided to run for two primary reasons. First, I've had enough of the so-called progressive agenda. Defund the police, letting criminals riot and loot with no consequences, not locking up dangerous people pending trial, opening our southern border, mask mandates, vaccine mandates, and on and on. And I've been walking, block walking in my neighborhood every afternoon for the last several weeks, and I can assure you I'm not the only person in Houston who's had enough of the nonsense. So I decided that it was time to stop yelling from the sidelines and get in the game. That's first. Second, more importantly, I actually want to do the job of being a city councilman. I'm running because I want to figure out ways to get the city's problem solved, which is the job of city council. As a general proposition, I'm for the less government, the better, and the lower taxes are, the better. <clears throat> but there are certain societal functions that pretty much have to be handled by local government, like policing, like road construction and maintenance, like drainage and flood control. <clears throat> and I see no reason why all neighborhoods in Houston can't be adequately and properly policed, or why all the streets can't be properly maintained, or why anybody's home or business has to flood, or why city government can't be more efficient and transparent. And that's my vision for Houston, and I will do everything humanly possible as a city councilman to try to make that vision a reality. Okay, thank you. Piper Millard, you're next. I'm sorry, Madeline, you're <laughs> next. Uh, tell us again who you are and why you're running for District G. I'm Piper Madland. I am a graduate of Rice. I have degrees in sociology and art. I'm a photographer. I also have a master's degree from the University of Houston at Clear Lake in history with a concentration in women's studies. I've lived in Houston on and off since I started at Rice in 1985. 
I've worked in several nonprofit organizations, including the Houston Food Bank and Diverse Works. I worked for Women in Their Work in Austin, where I was the operations manager. It's a great training for just about any job because you do everything, <laughs> every little thing. I've also been fortunate enough to be a stay-at-home mom, and I was chair of the Parents Guild at St. John's School after about 10 years of volunteering with all the different levels of volunteer opportunities at the school, I became in charge of over 300 parent volunteers. I've been volunteering at Rice since I was a student there. I did tours, I made phone calls for the Alumni Association, and I have been on the board of the Society of Rice University Women for the past 10 years. I was the president for four of those years. I'm currently the program chair. I've also volunteered with Rice 360 Institute for Global Health, which is a really exciting program that offers students the opportunity to work on real world global health pro problems and come up with actual solutions. I'm running because I like solving problems and I believe that constituent services are the most important part of this job. And I want to help our residents with when their trash doesn't get picked up or I want to help keep the roads free of potholes and try to get the city to coordinate where our construction projects so the traffic can be reduced. Um, I'm also running to be a team member on council to cooperate with my colleagues and work together to move Houston forward. All right, thank you very much. Roy Reyes. As you can obviously see, the people that are running for this position are qualified, good people. Uh, and so the difference between us is kind of our background and what we bring to the table. So I am a, a former firefighter out of Houston, uh, retired as a captain and promoted to assistant chief. And so I had experience from the standpoint of being an executive and sitting with the executive board that the mayor uh, oversaw. And so I, I know how the system works. I know how this, the, the city works. And uh, it's very obvious that what was said here was that city council, even though you represent a specific district, you are responsible for the overall, the functions of the city itself. And so uh, for an example, we're talking about great operations that are happening in district G as far as flooding or drainage. But if we don't do the whole city, it doesn't do any good. Because if you've got a 10 inch pipe and you're putting it into a four inch pipe, it's still gonna back up and flood. And so consequently, all the great things that are happening uh, in District G as far as what uh, Council Member Travis has done, uh, in my opinion, my responsibility as a council member would be to make sure that the projects and the programs that he's put in place are followed through. Because in essence, Whoever is fortunate enough to win this general, this special election, potentially is going to be in office for 10 years. Because there's two four-year terms that are not counted as part of this two. And so the opportunity to create your own uh, umbrella as to what you think the city needs to do and to build the coalitions with other council members to make sure things are done. Because under the present system, under the strong mayor form of government, it takes nine council members to get anything done. And so building uh, coalitions and allies and things of that nature become an important element of what the council member position is. Um, I've been in public service for well over 40 years. I've served in over 20 different organizations, some nonprofits, some for profit, some more business. Um, and so consequently, the organizations that I belong to, uh, for an example, I was on the advisory board, on the advisory board for the NAACP. I sat on the board for the Black Firefighters Caucus. I sat on the board for the Women Firefighters Caucus. And so consequently, I have a good blend of the diversity of the city and what it takes as far as building coalitions with these different organizations. Uh, and the communication part is a major aspect of it. Uh, and it's absolutely correct in that my background as of 35 years has been in public safety. And so I've been the incident commander for about eight different 
disasters that have happened in Houston or the greater Houston area. And I've worked for the, for the state under an organization out of San Antonio that deploys for disasters. And so I run operations for them during a disaster whenever I'm asked to deploy. Uh, and so I've been doing that for the last four or five years. And at this moment, I am officially retired and I can only play so much golf. And so now I'm in the position where I have the, I'm re-energized, I have the ability to do this uh, and speaking with several individuals that are prominent in District G, they convinced me that it's a good opportunity for me to run uh, because a special election and a short election, uh, pretty much anybody has the opportunity to win. Uh, if this was a year and a half type of uh, election, I probably would not be doing this. Uh, but this is an opportunity for me to go give back as far as being able to serve the city on the position where I can make a difference. Uh, so in essence, that's who I am. And I'm a candidate for District G. I appreciate that. Thank you all for your answers and your responses. I want to go to uh, another question. I'm going to ask you to, <clears throat> to uh, try to limit this response to about two minutes or so, maybe three minutes. Um, so as succinct, <clears throat> but I don't want you to, 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 to feel that you're under too much of a time constraint. Here's the question. Now, this may take me two minutes to get out. <laughs> uh, over the past few years, uh, natural disasters <clears throat> like flooding and last <clears throat> year's freeze have been major concerns for us here in Southeast Texas in the Houston area. And Houston residents have <clears throat> want to know what their city council member, their representatives are going to do about <clears throat> these issues, what they can do about these issues to help make sure that we don't aren't impacted like we've been in the past. So we're going to go backwards now. So uh, Roy, Reyes, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Can I interrupt for one second? Sure. Does that mean something happened? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I reclaim my time. No. <laughs> uh, be honest with you. Uh, over my years, I've been involved in a great number of disasters. I showed up in Houston uh, as a child in with, during Hurricane Carla, and so that was my first disaster. But uh, the more disasters you respond to, the more you use the National Incident Management Systems and the FEMA I Incident Command Systems, the better you become. And so consequently, um, I've become very well versed in being able to manage different elements of the Emergency Operations Center for the disaster. Uh, Houston is behind the times as far as responding to disasters. They, they don't respond as according to being able to um, prevent it. They're more into the response after the incident happens. And, and that's kind of a, a late time for anybody to learn how to do the operations. As a prime example, FEMA and ICS require certain forms to be filled out during disasters. And the city has historically failed to provide those documents in a timely manner. They're supposed to be submitted to the state and to FEMA every 10 to 12 hours. And that is the documentation that is sent to FEMA that FEMA then reimburses the city penny for penny of what they spent. The last three or four disasters, the city has failed to provide those documents. And so consequently, the city gets 15 to 20 cents return on every dollar that the city spent. And this Harvey was a prime example where the governor just flat out said, give me the documents and I'll give you the money. And there was no documents to be provided. So there was $50 million that was brought. And unfortunately, that wasn't enough to offset. I think there was like 15 people that were actually serviced by the money that was sent here. Um, and so from the disaster standpoint, I'm very much aware of what, what is required to handle a disaster in Houston. As far as things dealing with uh, electricity or, or things of the matter that, that we ran out of energy during the storms. Um, I would be the first one to tell you that as a city council member, there's limitations as to what a council member can do. 
they can do things in order to provide an overall view of what the city needs and what the city can do as far as uh, responding to issues at the state level or at the federal level. Uh, there are things that obviously can be done at the state level to handle this. It's a private corporation that's actually handling the, the uh, energy. Uh, and so I'm not sure if any council member can give you an answer that would satisfy the direct needs of the people as far as utilities are concerned. Those are entities that are outside the realm of authority of the city council. However, there are some things that council can do from the political side when they group together and they form a, a coalition to present to the state. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reyes. Piper, Madeline, how would you respond to that? What can the Houston City Council and you, if you have the position, do about responding to natural disasters to help alleviate problems for Houston residents? So climate change is a real problem for Houston and for the world, and the city council has to work with our county, state, and federal partners to reduce the impacts of climate change on <clears throat> our residents of District G. The flood control requires a partnership. The city is responsible for getting the water that comes off of your property mm. into a ditch or the bayou, and from there, the county takes over. So it's true that we don't have a ton of power unless we work with our partners. What's really important is that we get our flooding projects on the state flood plan, and I would work with those groups to get projects through the process so that they get on to the San Jacinto Regional Flood Plan and then into the state flood plan as that's the only way for flood flooding funding in the future. I'm also excited to see the results of the Willow Fork drainage project. The Army Corps of Engineers is going to do some excavation in the <clears throat> reservoir and that should increase capacity, which hopefully will prevent us from having the kind of flooding that we <clears throat> had on the west part of the district because of the release of the reservoir. Uh, and if that, that's a pilot project, so if that works well, then we can look to fund other projects that are similar. In terms of the grid, that is a state issue and our legislature worked to weatherize the grid this session. I hope that they can do some more toward that in the future. If we have a freeze or in a heat wave in the future, I would work with our nonprofit partners to make sure that we had comfort stations in the district so people could be safe and stay warm or stay cool as the case may be. And additionally, I would work with those who qualify to get the weatherization grants that the federal government offers to allow you to improve the, uh, the weatherization of your home. With proper planning, I think we can reduce the impact of climate change on the district. Okay, thank you very much. Duke Millard, Natural Disasters in Houston City Residents. Five points I'd like to make. First, drainage fees should be spent on drainage. About 50% of drainage fees are not spent on drainage, and honestly, it's about impossible to tell what they are spent on. Related to that, the charter provision which allowed for the collection of drainage fees needs to be fixed so that drainage fees can be spent on debt incurred in connection with drainage projects. Otherwise, it just simply takes too long to collect enough money to undertake the projects in a timely manner. That's first. Second, Piper was referring to the Attics and Barker Reservoirs need to be dredged like the San Jacinto River was because of the silt that is accumulated in the reservoirs. The Army Corps of Engineers earmarked $480 million of the bond money approved by voters in 2018 and has started the project. This project needs to be completed, but Judge Hidalgo has taken it upon herself to divert funds away from this project and two projects in parts of the county where people voted for her. <clears throat> she should stop diverting funds from this important project to suit her political ends. Third, Memorial City TERS, which has done a lot of good drainage and related road improvement work, needs to be renewed. Fourth, the Army Corps of Engineers has proposed a tunnel under the city to get overflow water to the Gulf. It's a good idea, but estimates of the cost have been as high as $200 billion. The city's whole budget is $5 billion, so $200 billion is an awful lot of money and means it's not likely to be done until the costs come down. If costs come down, it's something that should be considered. Can I have 
20 more seconds? Okay. Uh, with regard to the other part of your question about the electrical outage and all that, um, as my fellow candidate said, the city wasn't responsible for the electrical outages last winter, but the city's generators did fail, and so water pressure wasn't maintained. Obviously, that needs to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And of course, if city council determines that the state has not done everything necessary to avoid a repeat, then city council ought to be banging the drum until the state does do what's necessary to be done. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Millard. Um, I'm going to start back with you again okay. on this next question. Yep. Um, and it's kind of a, a continuation. Other than flooding and mm -hmm. freezing, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the most pressing issues affecting District G? And if elected, <laughs> what steps would you take to address those issues? Okay. Well, obviously, I can't take steps by myself, but the number one problem from everybody I've talked to is the ever-increasing crime rate. According to crime stats pub published on the HPD website, over 14% of the total crimes reported in Houston in 2021 were committed in District G zip codes, while District G has less than 10% of the population. The businesses along Westheimer particularly feel the impact of this criminal activity. We need more police. By way of example, Chicago's population is about 15% larger than Houston's. Chicago has over 12,000 police officers. Houston has a little over 5,000 police officers. So as I said, obviously Houston needs more police officers. But more police is not enough. Houston also needs smarter but policing. For example, CompStat is a program, I want to get this accurate, that requires police to gather and report timely, accurate information about crime patterns and then respond quickly to impact those patterns. Bill Bratton used it in New York and LA and got good results. A lot of big cities have implemented it and HPD ought to implement it. Second, until HPD is able to hire a sufficient number of new officers and train them, HPD ought to consider hiring back retired officers on a temporary basis. Take advantage of the experience of retired officers. Third, HPD ought to implement software and communication systems that can interface with the sheriff's office and constable offices so policing efforts can be coordinated more effectively. <clears throat> and lastly, for the time being, HPD should take cases against particularly dangerous people to the feds, who I'm told will lock people up pending trial, until the Harris County District judges who won't lock dangerous people up pending trial can be voted out next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Piper, Madeline. How would, what do you see as some of the pressing issues in District G and how would you respond as a city council person? Well, I definitely agree that public safety is a big concern for all residents of District G. One of my solutions is I would like to see improvements in the Houston Police Department's mental health division. Uh, we have some good trained officers there, but it's very traumatic if you're in a mental health crisis to have a police officer be the person who shows up at your door to help you. And I would like to see trained specialists in mental health and medical professionals be sent out on those calls. There's a program in Eugene, Oregon called CAHOOTS, which has worked very well. And about 12% of their calls through the 911 system go out with these specialists. This would also free up more police officers to do the patrols and, and especially to take extra time around the holidays at the shopping centers where we are having an increase in robberies and things like that. I would also pressure the county and the state to reduce the number of violent criminals who are released through the for-profit bail system, but I also want to protect the non-violent offenders from sitting in jail just because they're poor. I'm also interested in making sure that the women and minority owned business disparity study happens. It's time for that to happen. And we need to make sure that our city contractors are following those guidelines. And I wanna follow up on the contractors who have already been given a year to come up to standard and make sure that they are doing that. Equity of economic opportunity for all businesses in Houston is really important to me. and. Uh, District G is a huge economic driver in the city. All right, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Reyes, uh, same question to you. As if you were sitting on city council for District G, what are some of the pressing issues you think are facing the district and how would you respond to them? 
first of all, I had a conversation with Troy Finner, the police chief, and the discussions that we had was he inherited a mess to begin with. Um, and consequently, he's only one of the elements of the criminal justice system. And if you don't fix the rest of it, you can't simply blame the police for not being able to keep people off the streets, repeat offenders, or just being arrested uh, multiple times. But for District G, the discussions that we had was in Montrose and, and uh, Westheimer and Green, Greens Point uh, and in, on Ranchester and Bel Air, when the crime hit a high peak, then the police department put storefronts there. And either the crime either dissipated or it was disseminated, but it worked. And so the two areas that are primary, during the season, the Galleria gets a hit on crime for obvious reasons. But the big crime is happening around Briar Forest between Wilcrest and Kirkwood. Uh, on, on Derry Ashford, there is a constable's office there, but that's not their purpose. Uh, and then you have the West Side, Cham uh, West Side uh, Command Station that has a quick response if they're not changing shifts. But a storefront on Wilcrest and Bryforce or Bryforce and Kirkwood would have a, an immediate impact on the spike in the crime that's happening in those areas. And for whatever reason, I'm not going to be put into a spot where I'm going to try to explain why there's crime there. It's just that it is there. The other concept was uh, in 95, the idea of putting a task force together between constables, sheriff's office, and police, because police did not have enough people for, for patrolling, to put a, a task force together in each of the 11 districts uh, in specific areas. And that's a temporary job to put that, that in there, but they handle a high crime, the high percentage crimes or the high profile crimes if for those specific districts. That will have an immediate impact on the crime spikes. Uh, but until the criminal justice system is completely fixed, then what we have to do is protect District G from uh, the overflow that may be coming in this direction. And it's coming. Westheimer is, is a prime example. Um, and so there's ideas as to how we can fix that. The task force seems to work. The storefront seem to work. Um, but that's just one of the big issues there. The, the other part of that is there's some of these neighborhoods where they're tearing down houses that poten potentially cost four or $500,000 and they're putting up a $2 million home there. And it's causing a, a, trauma a dramatic effect on the cost of living as far as the housing is concerned in, in, in a lot of those areas. We have some very affluent neighborhoods, but we also have neighborhoods that, um, like for example, Walnut Bend, it's a very nice neighborhood. Uh, but it's, it's having an economic impact on the surrounding areas that are happening there. Uh, so if, as far as that's concerned, as far as crime is concerned, uh, and I totally agree with, with Duke that uh, Tier 17, which is the memorial, uh, it comes up in 2029. It needs to be expanded another 15, 20 years so that they can take loans out short-term loans or long-term loans to be able to continue the projects that they have going on in those areas. Um, and so I see those are the immediate areas of concern, but uh, I agree with my colleagues here where there's a bunch of other things, mental health issues and things of that nature I totally agree with. Uh, but those are my concepts, the task force and the storefronts. Uh, and again, the police chief is wide open to all any suggestions that you have that's going to negatively affect the crime rate. Okay, thank you very much. Let me, you, you've <clears> talked <throat> about several issues. All of you have brought up several issues. I wanna come back to those in a few minutes. Uh, but, but, but to head off, one of the things that you're all kind of touching on, look, Houston is a diverse city, <clears throat> a diverse population, <clears throat> District G, uh, running along Westheimer from downtown uh, the downtown area all the way out to, to, near, to nearly Katy uh, and then up to Interstate 10 in that area, except for the villages, is a very mixed area. There's a lot of businesses along Westheimer, as you brought out. Uh, there's a lot of uh, multifamily and, 
and mixed residential areas. And there's also some very established, settled neighborhoods as well. So it's a diverse area, just like Houston is diverse. How are you, as a city council member, if elected to District G, how will you work with not only diverse representatives, the diverse population that you'll represent, but also the diverse people on city council. There's a lot of different voices on there. And, and as uh, some of you have uh, mentioned earlier, you've got to work with them as well. So how are you going to blend those issues together? Uh, Mr. Reyes, we'll start with you. To be very clear, the District G, from, Kirk, from Kirby to Highway 6 and from Westheimer to I-10, there is a diversity happening, but it's on the west side of Beltway. On the east side of Beltway, the diversity is just has been the same uh, since time began. We're talking about Tanglewood and Galleria and River Oaks, and, and we're excluding the villages, mind you. But still, that process comes through. You have to go through the villages to get from one side of Houston to the other. The diversity happens on the west side of Beltway 8. And it, diversity happens because there's been some uh, application of either Section 8 property and or apartments that have come up. And there's been some, from, if you go from Beltway 8, south of the Briar Forest, all the way to Derry Ashford, you'll see diversity there, but you won't see it anywhere else. It just, it just it's a very limited area. Uh, as far as uh, diversity is concerned, I've been on the national board for LULAC. I've been on the advisory for NAACP. I'm part of the black firefighters and, and the Hispanic firefighters and the white firefighters. Uh, and I've been on so many boards that deal with AMA and the Tejano Center and with uh, uh, United Way, uh, YMCA. I've been on all those boards where I was forced to deal with diversity issues and I was able to handle those. And what I did, for example, for YMCA is I told them when we build a really nice YMCA in a predominantly white area, 10% of that needs to go to the inner city YMCA because they can't afford to have that, that kind of money. And so we were able to diversify some of those issues. I know pretty much all of the council members. Um, and so one of the things that is being brought up is LULAC has asked for the five... Uh, five at-large positions to be dissolved and for those there to be 16 uh, uh, individual districts and that should imply that there'll be some more diversity on city council uh, but in a city that has 48 percent Hispanic to have one Hispanic on city council it, to me that's a problem and I don't know whether the Hispanics just won't vote or whether the five at large creates a, a diversity issue uh, for them as well. And so I do belong to a lot of organizations that deal with diversity and with low income and high. And so um, I've been successful in all of the interactions that I've had with them. I build good networks with them. And I, I feel very confident that if there's a diversity issue in that area, that I will be contacted immediately and there'll be a resolution very quickly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Piper Madland, diverse city of Houston, <clears throat> a lot of different personalities <clears throat> on city council, uh, and in District G, a diverse residents, diverse population. How are you going to work with all of those uh, diverse people? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, accessibility is a key. I'm happy to give out my cell phone number. I've actually printed it on my my campaign materials already, so it's out there in the world. People are free to call and text me. Um, I'm, I'll be going into our communities and meeting with the HOAs, the churches, the neighborhood groups, asking what needs to get done and how I can help. And when it's safe, I wanna have coffee with the council members so I can go out into the various parts of the district and meet with constituents and get to hear from them. I also wanna institute Zoom town halls. I think that's a great way for constituents to reach their council members without having to come all the way down to the city. 
And um, I also want to mm -hmm. build community through fun events. And mm -hmm. I want to keep working to try to get a community center in the district. I'm having my campaign literature translated into Spanish and I'm working with some organizations to reach out to mm -hmm. Latino voters in the district and make sure that I'm you know, connecting with them and, and answering their questions. I have been working to get endorsements from a lot of vari various constituencies and I've worked and volunteered with organizations that serve diverse populations. I've worked with Texas Organizing Project on a drive, driving voters to the polls project. As I, as I said, I worked at Houston Food Bank. Um, I have connections to some of the various constituencies of the district and I am also, uh, I am a connector. I'm the kind of person who likes to make connections with people. So I think that when I'm on city council, I'll be able to work with everybody there and try to figure out how we can all work together to bring Houston to a better place. And I want to be the voice for all residents of District G on the city council. Okay, thank you very much. Duke Millard. Yeah, you don't need to repeat the question. I, I got it, I got <laughs> okay. it. Okay. <laughs> and Gene, I, I mean no disrespect here, but um, I don't agree with the premise of your question, which is that non-white Houstonians in District G and on city council should somehow be treated differently than white Houstonians in District G and on city council. I don't believe in treating people differently based on the color of their skin, their ethnic origin, their religion, or any other artificial basis. I didn't do that in my business, and I won't do that on city council. All the neighborhoods in District G should have adequate and proper policing. All of the streets in District G should be properly maintained. All of the neighborhoods and commercial developments in District G should get adequate drainage so flooding does not occur. I will not treat neighborhoods who have more non-white Houstonians any differently than neighborhoods who have more white Houstonians. We're all Houstonians, and I will not be pulled into the divisiveness that does nothing but get in the way of solving the city's problems. And I'm probably not using all my time, but... Well, let me follow up on this, because sure. diversity means more than just ethnicity. Diversity can also mean businesses versus residences, uh, multifamily versus single family. Um, and as you're, you know, certainly the diverse ethnic nature, uh, but also diverse income, uh, diverse <clears throat> background. Um, and, and that's what I mean by the question. So that's the diversity question. It is, and city council as well. How, what about the diverse representatives on city council. This is something you brought up initially in your first statement, is that you have to work with all these different divergent ideas, which is also diversity. Right. So how do you how do you deal with all of that? And again, I, I, I'm sorry, I go back to the same answer. I, I, I just don't think it matters, right? I think you treat everybody the same. Now, yes, okay, maybe, you know, multifamily, mm -hmm. people living in multifamily type situations mm -hmm. have different concerns than people living in $2 million houses. So, okay, so you don't treat them exactly the same, but, but my point is you try to deal with all the problems of everybody. You don't just help the rich people. You don't just help the poor people. You help everybody. Same on city council. You don't just talk to the people that think like you do. You talk to everybody on city council and try to reach consensus on whatever you can reach consensus on. I, I have no problem with, you know, anybody that has different <coughs> ideas than I do or thinks differently than I do, and hopefully you can communicate and reach consensus on third, certain things and if you you know and agree to disagree if you if you don't agree on policy issues so th that's what i mean by that i don't mean only by ethnicity i mean like in all contexts treat everybody the same treat everybody the same and you're fine right you don't you don't have to walk on eggshells or not say this or not say that if you treat everybody the same in my opinion all right thank you very much and and, and you know i think that is uh, one of the issues and and when we're looking at the the different types of, of businesses, and and this is something that you've all brought up, so I want to I want to throw a, a question in, and this is uh, uh, I'm I'm kind of throwing this at you cold, <laughs> so uh, prepare yourselves. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about transportation, and one of the the, the issues that that mm -hmm. you have all brought up, the policing issue is a big issue, right? Uh, we're we're living in a time that a lot the police are under a lot of criticism. And, but we want our businesses, we want our homes, we want our families to be safe. <laughs> we um, have some big highways and uh, transportation issues here in Houston. And Westheimer's on the south, 
border of mm -hmm. the district. Correct. Interstate 10 is on the north border, and then you've got a couple of uh, <clears throat> uh, loops, a uh, beltway tied in to, to, to dissect the district too. Wow, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a lot to deal with for anybody. So mm -hmm. what are some of these other issues that you think are gonna come up as a city council member that you're gonna have to deal with? And let me give you a couple of minutes to, to, uh, to respond to that, and we'll start with you. I'll put you back on the spot. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't have answers to all the city's problems. I, I don't even know what all the problems are. I learn about a new one every day. Uh, what I'm committed to doing is, one, learning about the problems, two, talking to people that know a lot more about the problems than I do to figure out solutions to the problems, <clears throat> three, working with everybody, including private sector people, to try to get the problem solved. Um, with regard to transportation, you know, there's that um, bus line that runs just east of the Galleria. That was sold as 15,000 people a day were going to ride that bus line. <coughs> Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on that. <coughs> 750 people ride that bus line a day. Metro wastes a lot of money. So I think a lot of the money from Metro ought to be diverted to the police and firefighters. Um, I think every time I'm in front of the rail line and the train goes by, there's maybe two people on there. And I'm doing that pretty often. Every Wednesday I go down to volunteer at a homeless service place and I see the trains and there's nobody on them. Now, maybe that's a unique time of day or whatever, but I don't think so. Um, so I think we're wasting a lot of money on mass transportation, and we ought to be more focused and targeted to the buses that people actually ride and make those better rather than bus lines through the Galleria and rail. Um, I know that's probably not a very popular position, um, but in terms of transportation, those are my thoughts now. Again, I'm not an expert, and I'm still learning, and I plan to keep learning, but those are my initial thoughts on I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure it answers your question, but well, no, I, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question I'm just uh, throwing out there based upon yours, and so it's a, it's a follow up. And uh, like I say, I didn't, you know, the, the other questions are, are kind of easy, and I just kind of patched that one together. So I appreciate you taking it off the cuff and being the first Happy person to. to go to it. <laughs> so uh, Piper, how would you respond to, to that question? You know, transportation, <clears throat> uh, the highways. Uh, uh, the busing issue is something I hadn't even thought about. That's a, that's a great response. How are you gonna deal with some of those? Well, I'm happy to see that the city already has a Vision Zero program <laughs> and a plan, and that's something that I think we need to continue to focus on. Many of the areas in that plan that are high, <laughs> I forget exactly what the term is, but places where there's a lot more accidents that involve cars and people, are in District G, and so the the Vision Zero plan is important to to Vision to District G in terms of improving the traffic and reducing accidents. Um, I think Houston is such a large city, and transportation is such a huge issue because you have to go so far to get from one place to another. So we have terrible car traffic. We need flexible bus systems that can get people from one place to another, and Fortunately, you know, we didn't plan ahead and build a subway system or something like that that New York City uses very efficiently and we're trying to catch up now and figure out how we can best move our people through the city. Um, I'm also a cyclist and so I really want to make sure that we have as many bicycle lanes as possible in safe places. Mm -hmm. It's harrowing to try to ride your bicycle on a lot of Houston streets, but that's also really helpful to the climate. If more people would ride their bikes, we could ride our bikes to work if we had that opportunity, but it's often too scary to do that. So those are some of the things that <coughs> so it's called multimodality transportation involving mass transit, our cars, our bikes, walking, make it more walkable in the places that it makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Reyes. I wanna emphasize something that Duke said. We're talking about public safety 
and we keep talking about the police as if that's the only thing that concerts public safety. We haven't said anything about EMS or fire. They are also public safety, and they also need to be taken care of. Uh, and people's lives can be put at stake if you don't have people that are manning those fire stations. Having said that, and I, I appreciate Duke bringing that up, um, City Council, they are responsible, even though you have a constituency in District G, you're responsible for the whole city. And to me, when the county does things that offset or disrespect the gridlock and the transportation that's necessary for Houston, and you have the Department of Justice or Attorney General's office, along with the Harris County Commissioner's office, filing lawsuit against TxDOT to prevent them from fixing the I-10 and the 45 north and south ramps. They're going to displace about 200, 300 people, but they're going to be paid for their property and they're going to be helped to be able to stay in that area, just not in those vicinities. So there's a lot of things that the city or the county does that does, just doesn't make any sense. For them to file a lawsuit for those $4 billion or $5 billion that TxDOT is willing to put into Houston to fix a lot of the gridlock. Uh, my deal is with the uh, toll roads, West Park toll road. It's in gridlock every morning, every afternoon. Uh, and commercial just goes wherever brick, wherever concrete is laid. There was an engineer that said, if you want to fix I-10, close down every other on-ramp and every other off-ramp. Because when there's an off-ramp, commercial comes in and it offsets the water, can't drain. And it, so that idea was kind of taken into effect when they did the new corridor on, on 610 uh, going west on I-10, where they actually made separate uh, entities and they made you go past Silver in order to come back to Silver. So what they're doing for 610 is great. 610-59, 610 610-I-10, what they're doing there is great. A lot of the projects that are being done as far as streets in District G, that's incredible. It went from 11% to 13% return of the tax dollars into District G. And I, and I credit uh, Council Member Travis for that. Um, but our responsibility is to extend that to 13, 15, 16% if possible. And it can be done through proper coalitions. And you vote for them, they vote for you, that sort of entity. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of the rail, when I spoke to Gilbert Garcia, who was the chairman at the time, I told him, making these trains, train a uh, uh, ground level is insane in Houston. There's a reason that in Chicago and in Boston, they're else, they're elevated, so you don't block the traffic and you have ways of going up and down. I said, you can't have a tunnel at medical center because it's going to flood. If you got three inches of rain, the train stops. And, and going to the east train that goes to Magnolia, there's like two or three people a day that ride that. Wasted money. Wasted money. So the, the money is not so much that Metro doesn't have it. It's that the board thinks in terms of antiquities and things of what might have happened in the past. Uh, every one of those trains should be elevated. And there should be a train that goes, follows I-10, preferably down the middle of the HOV lane, uh, that can be done. There's enough weight that can be held um, and just do the same thing to the traffic, to all the, the major freeways. Uh, there, there's plans that, that can be done that other cities have done. Part of my master's degree was in organizational development which means you take national standards, regional concepts, and best practices and bring them to Houston and apply those that need to be done. We haven't done that. And so as a council member, you have the opportunity to, um, to get with others <coughs> and to form the ideas as to what needs to be done, it, even in spite of whatever the, the, the county commissioners do. And hopefully there'll be some changes as far as the commission's is concerned that they'll come back to their senses and start doing things that are in the best interest of all the Houstonians and not just certain sections. So on January <clears throat> 25th, it's a Tuesday? Correct. 2022? <clears throat> Four weeks from day before yesterday. <laughs> we're gonna have a special election for District G residents. And it's to elect 
one of five candidates, and we have three of the candidates here. And so in the last few minutes that we have remaining, I'd like for each of you to tell us, and we're going to start, Roy, with you, why you're the best candidate <laughs> and where people can go to learn more information or to contact you. Everybody who's running is good people. They wouldn't be running unless they felt they were qualified. The difference is what people have to make is what is your background and, you know, education. I don't have a law degree, but I respect the fact that um, I have a management degree. And so, in essence, uh, my background is in community service of 40 years, as in public safety for 35 years. I have a bachelor's in business and a master's in organizational development and management. Uh, and I am officially, as of four days ago, I'm officially retired. And so I have five different retirements over a 40 year period. Uh, and so financially, I'm pretty well set. So I'm not doing this for the money because I think, what do we get, 40,000, 50,000 or something? That, that buys 60. me. 60. That, 60? 60. 50. All right. Thank you. <laughs> no, six zero. Six zero. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with all that money. I mean, just, <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's my background. Uh, if you go to my website, it's Raul Reyes for District G. Uh, and it'll give you pretty much anything you want to know about me. My phone number, I'll be more than happy to give is 281-451-9700. Um, and uh, by the way, on the bottom of that web website, there is a donate button. Just, <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate that uh, I feel like that I have an opportunity to win because it's a short race and it's a offset race. January 25th is only for District G. You know, I'm kind of hoping that it's cold and raining and blowing and everything else. <laughs> but either way, uh, whatever percentage of voters come out, then, you know, the best person is going to win based on that. Thank you very much. Piper Madland. Uh, I am the best candidate because I want to serve for a long time. We have the opportunity with this special election to serve for 10 years, as my, as the other candidate said. <clears throat> for me, this is not a stepping stone. I'm not looking to win this position so that I can run for something else. And I want to build community while I'm helping my neighbors solve their problems. I will be around long enough that I'll be less inclined to pass short-term solutions to long-term problems. Kicking the can down the road is pretty common on city council with term limits. And uh, I think whoever is in this position has the opportunity to really make some changes. I'll be a financial watchdog at city hall. I wanna make sure that we have balanced budgets and that our funds are used appropriately. And I also will coordinate to make sure that the district receives all the state and federal funding that it's entitled to. I'll be a cheerleader for District G. It's an economic powerhouse for the city and it's important that we get our fair share of the revenues back to the district. I'll lobby the county, state and federal levels so that we get the funds that we're allowed there and also that the concerns that are important to District G are brought to the attention. I'm concerned about issues that are big and small. I've already been speaking with voters in the district and I've heard about concerns about traffic and that's both inside the loop and outside, solid waste issues, flooding concerns, and there are people who don't want any sidewalk on their property and there are others who are very concerned with having their sidewalks improved. Uh, these day-to-day -day concerns are the most important part of the job and I love solving problems. So I want everyone to feel safe at home from flooding and extreme weather, safe at work, and safe on the streets. And I want to make sure your trash and your recycling get picked up. If you elect me, um, I will focus on all of this. My website is pipermadland.com. My phone number is 713-469-1785. I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Piper for District G, and I'm on Twitter at Piper District G. I'm an empty nester who has a lot of time to devote to this, and I will be transparent, accessible, and caring. Thank you very much. Duke Millard? Again, no disrespect, but I am not a fan of that question uh, because almost any answer requires me to be a politician, and I am not a politician. So I'm not going to use my three minutes. I will simply say that I believe my education, training, professional experience, and life experience are different 
from the people, the other candidates, and I trust voters in District G to decide who the best candidate is. Uh, voters who want to learn more about me and my campaign can go to dukefordistrictg.com, and Facebook page is also Duke for District G, and that's D-U-K-E-F-O-R District G. I want to say thank you to you, and thank you to the League of Women Voters making it available for us to connect with the voters, um, and appreciate the questions. Thank you very much. So Duke Millard, Piper Madland, and Roy Reyes Jr., I want to thank you all for joining us and for answering my questions, whether you like them or not. And uh, but that's part of the uh, part of the uh, part of the process, and we're glad you're doing it. I want to thank each of you for stepping up and putting your names in the hats and running. I think um, you know it takes good people like all three of you are uh, to. <clears throat> Put yourself out there. A lot of people don't do that, and thank you for doing that. Thank you for coming down and for joining us and for the, the, two, repres the two candidates who weren't able to make it. We want to wish them the best of luck as well and wish you all the best of luck. Remember, the election in District G is a special election. January 25th, 2022. Early voting? Early voting is January about to get 10th underway. January 10th to the 21st, that's right. Is it, is it two 10th? weeks? January 10th. January 10th to January 21st. Yeah, so not on Martin Luther that. King Day, not on, not on January 17th. Okay. So, uh, and we're going to be airing this program uh, on Houston Media Source TV uh, from time to time uh, between now and the election. So uh, you're you. going to have plenty of time to learn about these candidates mm -hmm. and to follow up with them. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for joining us on Conversations with the Candidates with the League of Women Voters of Houston, I'm Gene Preuss, and thank you to Houston Media Source TV for hosting it tonight. It's great to be back with you. Have a good night.